Welcome to Candid Conversation on how do we advance gender equality in the face of danger. My name is Shahira Amin. I'm a Cairo-based independent journalist. And I'd like to welcome Heather Jarvis, feminist, activist, educator, and co-founder of Slut Walk, a grassroots initiative to end violence, victim blaming, and slut shaming. Wima Askari, uh, co-chair of African Queer Youth Initiative, and Carla Aguirre, Planned Parenthood uh, Federation of America and Planned Parenthood Global. Carla, let's begin with you. Girls and women, especially those living in poverty, have little uh, or no access to information on their sexual and reproductive health rights. Uh, no services as well. But there are other barriers besides poverty to women attaining their sexual and reproductive rights. Thanks, uh, Shahir. I, I'm really excited to be here with you all and sharing like this space with amazing colleagues. Uh, yeah, uh, well, actually, I in Latin America, uh, girls are suffering from like sexual violence at staggering proportions. Uh, actually, uh, what we are seeing is that one million girls and adolescents are suffering from sexual violence. And then uh, what we see is that these girls, instead of getting the protection and the care that they need and that they deserve, uh, they, have, they are forced into pregnancies and into motherhood against their will because of the lack of access to reproductive health services. And lack of knowledge as well. Yes, and, and lack of information, yes and sometimes at a very early age. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, at Planned Parenthood Global, we have developed uh, a regional research um, where we see uh, that girls that have been victims of sexual abuse, uh, they get uh, like a tremendous impact in their physical, mental, and social health due to, uh, to forced pregnancies. And this is not just due to poverty. There are other factors at play here. Uh, the stigma, perhaps, and uh, laws. Yes, absolutely. When I was thinking like about like the dangers uh, that girls face in these cases, we see uh, that girls f first face uh, disabuse because of the perpetrators of this sexual violence that are generally uh, members of their own families or people close uh, to their surroundings. And then what we see is uh, that it's actually like the state, the laws that are forcing them into, into pregnancy. Uh, so it's uh, actually the system that compounds the violence and the abuse by denying them access to healthcare. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a minute. But first, Heather, you believe that everyone is entitled to live with respect and in safety and that no one should be torn down because of who they are. But the reality is very different in many parts of the world. Absolutely. I think we really have to always look into context about what is happening in different lands and different nations. Uh, laws are very, very different around the world. And while we want to hold on to the optimistic idea that everybody should be treated with respect, we know that that's not the case. Unfortunately, we still live in a world that is very much based on a hierarchy of women and girls. Who gets to matter? Who gets respected? Who is deemed respectable? and who isn't. So one of the biggest learning curves I had through the Slut Walk movement was learning from hundreds of other organizers around the world uh, who were often um, queer and trans, who were sex workers, who were migrants, who were people working off the side of their desk um, in different nations, fighting multiple causes. So I think we always have to remember where we are. Um, you know. What about the indigenous peoples across Canada and Turtle Island? Uh, just yesterday we heard an announcement that Canada has actually been labeled a genocide for indigenous women and girls in this nation. Um, we have to think about the people who we don't even see, like people who are filling up our prisons. Um, women and girls at high rates are in our prisons, and we have to care about them too, even when they're not physically in the streets with us, they're not at our tables, we have to make sure that those are the stories we're bringing with us. So I think that that's where I try to come from more and more. The invisible, the stigmatized, the censored, and we'll hear more about your work in just a minute. But Wima, 
In many African countries, members of the LGBTQIA community uh, are targeted and pay a heavy price for their sexual orientation. They're often accused of being mentally ill and are urged to seek medical treatment. Is the threat from the legal system or is it from society or both? Well, it's actually from, from more than the, just that. Um, in Africa, we have like in at least three countries, people would be jail, uh, would be jailed uh, for for life. In more than five countries, they could uh, face uh, death penalty. In more than three six uh, thirty six countries, they could jail for at least uh, more than five years in jail. And it's not just the laws, but the laws they help a lot. They they have a huge impact in it. It's the religion, it's the culture, it's um, society, it's our like families and the way we were raised and the things that we got used to it. So it's not something that people are used to seeing. It's something we think it, it's coming from the West. So it's not part of our culture. So um, it's a lot of things that contribute and to that, to making people fear to just exist and be free the way they are. Uh, I know that in Egypt, where I come from, they're subjected to humiliating anal tests. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to know what the African Queer Youth Initiative is doing to improve the situation uh, for Africa's LGBTQIA plus communities. Well, the first thing we, we try to do is to help them understand how to protect themselves, to focus on their safety and security, like um, online security, for example, like when using apps and all, how to protect your identity, how to protect yourself. Um, we try to get them the awareness about the laws that exist in their countries and um, if they're facing any issues, get, get them in touch with local NGOs in their countries or international NGOs that could help them out in their situation. At the same time, we're like a network of LGBTIQ plus uh, activists, so we're trying to, to work together to, to come out with solutions and how to help each other because the situations, as different as they are in all the countries, they're all the same. And we're trying to find ways how to work all together. So basically, it's a support network. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carla, what is Planned Parenthood Global doing for girls in Central America? Well, Planned Parenthood Global has been working overseas for over 45 years, and we work with partners across Africa and Latin America. And we do this, uh, like, we, we're working on three main pillars of work. The first one is we work directly with partners on service delivery. Mm -hmm. Also, we support with partners on advocacy efforts uh, to support sexual and reproductive uh, rights. Mm -hmm. And also we uh, work in programs uh, regarding social norms. So it's this three-pronged approach uh, that creates and um, fosters an environment for uh, the fulfillment of reproductive rights and that ensures um, sustainable change. Um, so, as part of, uh, of this work that we, uh, that we do, actually, uh, last week, we filed a lawsuit against Ecuador, against uh, Nicaragua and Guatemala uh, for the cases of four girls who have, been, uh, who have suffered sexual violence and then denied access uh, to reproductive health services. So, uh, with, by, by filing these cases, uh, what we are uh, looking for is to get justice and reparation for, for the girls, for Norma, for Fatima, uh, for Lucia, and for Susana. But also we are calling um, like for state's action for the implementation of the laws and policies that will ensure access to safe and legal abortion for girls. And you're also creating awareness about their plight. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, actually, like with the... With the filing of these cases, uh, we had like a very good opportunity for the voices of these girls to be heard around the world uh, and across Latin America. Actually, uh, with uh, with this uh, with this action. Um, uh, uh, campaign, like a movement across the region that it's called Niñas No Madres has been energized. Okay. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to, to join us uh, at the campaign Niñas No Madres. Online? Yeah, you can do it online. You can visit our website and also follow the conversation with the hashtag Niñas No Madres.
Uh, Heather, what are some of the challenges that you faced in your work uh, trying to create safer spaces of support for uh, people that are invisible and stigmatized? And how have you dealt with those challenges? I think first and foremost, um, it's a learning curve. Uh, all of us who are doing this work, we're so passionate, but we have to listen to each other, we have to learn from each other, we have to sometimes sit down and shut up <laughs> to listen to each other, um, and we have to show up when we've made mistakes. You know, all of us do make mistakes, so I think a big part of it is a learning curve to make sure we know about who isn't here, which is always difficult because you don't know, but that is work we have to be dedicated to, um, and making sure that we're fighting for the most stigmatized, the most pop unpopular, the biggest bad girls out there, if they are safe, we're doing a great job. So young girls who have been sexually assaulted but also need abortions. Um, LGBTQ folks in African nations who are criminalized, arrested, uh, treated like they don't get to belong. Um, sex working women who are so often, even in our feminist movements, continuously left behind. Um, you know, I hope as Women Deliver moves forward in the years, we get to see more sex worker representation even in this conference. Um, incarcerated women, um, women who use drugs, women who show up on shelter doorsteps, who smell like the streets because they are struggling with untreated mental health and they're messy. So these are the women we need to show up for. You know, thinking about how many black trans women have been murdered in the US in the last few months alone. These are the stories you need to hear. These are the stories we need to lift up and to make sure the baddest of girls are safe in our movements. But even though there is some progress in some places, uh, in other places, as you said, uh, the situation is, is dire. dire. <laughs> yes. Uh, and there is a lot of resistance to the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, opposition, I, uh, when Slut Walk was first uh, yeah. established, it's now evolved into an international movement. But in the early beginnings, you faced opposition. We, we definitely did, and it was also a moment in time. Um, so when Slut Walk began, it was in Toronto in response to a police officer's comments that said women should stop dressing like sluts to avoid being victimized. And so we reacted in our city, in our space. We never had any idea that it would hit a nerve, an exposed nerve, for so many other people. And I think the saddest lesson that I've had to learn is there's words to dehumanize and to sexually degrade women and girls in every language. It's cross, cross borders. Um, so I think the opposition is also about the words we use. People don't want to talk about them. Sexual assault can be verbal as well as physical. Mm. Absolutely, but what do we do when, when we can have the space to say words like rape more and more, words like sexual violence, but you can't talk about whores. You can't talk about, I was called a bitch first. You can't talk about the words that just encompassed you when you faced violence. Um, these words that are slung at us all the time. So we wanted to talk about that. And I think, um, of course, there was backlash from the usual suspects. But I think some of the toughest um, was within the women's movement itself. A lot of women who said, this is the wrong way. This is the wrong way to be a woman. This is the wrong way to do feminism. This is the wrong way to fight. This is the wrong way to dress. You're playing into patriarchy. Um, some of those criticisms were essential and important. And some of them were just incredibly difficult to have some of our own feminists eat their own. Um, we have to be able to have different paths in different ways. There is no one size fits all. So it was, uh, it's an ever growing, ever changing, evolving movement. Uh Weema, on a more positive note, yeah. uh, can you share some of the success stories with us about how your organization has overcome adversity? Well, um, the first success thing is me being here with you, like with all these amazing ladies and sharing the story and talking. Um, <clears throat> we've been able to, to get people to be more present in some international, um, international conferences which is really awesome because of the visibility thing. Um, usually when we talk about Africa, if we raise the question of LGBTIQ+, like people would be saying it's not the time. Like there are m much more important more issues, that, yeah, issues that we should focus on. Mm -hmm. So if we have people from all around Africa present in conferences and speaking and talking and bringing the issue to the table, that's like a huge success for us. And that's what we're trying to do more and more to, to be visible and to like expose uh, everything that we were doing, expose the issues and try to find common things, how to work together. 
So you believe that you can forge partnerships uh, that can give you support from other organizations? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, she was saying that um, one of the most hard things and when you get feminists like coming against your, the work you're doing, I really believe in intersectionality, like it's the solution to everything. If we can find common things and all understand that this is a common cause, this is th something that we can all relate to in a way or another, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Any success stories that Carla or Heather would like to share with us? Well, I was just thinking about that and how, uh, how diversity is what really makes us stronger. How, like, how the different voices really empower us all together. Yeah. So yeah, that was something that just, yeah. I was just thinking now. <laughs> I think it's incredible that you have four, four younger women who are joining onto a lawsuit that's terrifying but incredibly courageous and uh, for them to have support and backing is amazing. Um, I get lifted up by hearing these stories and constantly being reminded that we're not alone. <laughs> that when it feels so hard, when it feels like you're fighting governments and laws and each other and organizations, that we have s different fights but they all overlap. All of them do. Um, so I, I I'm enjoying this so much. <laughs> so you need to join hands and close ranks yeah. and unite. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, right, if we can wrap up with each of you uh, telling us how you will use your power here at Women Deliver 2019 to push for action for greater gender equality. Carla? Well, I think that I'll continue working alongside with women and organizations across Latin America. Uh, to make sure that, that girls and women can really uh, fulfill like, th their reproductive rights. I really feel uh, that gender equality will never be fully achieved until all girls and women can make their own decisions about like, on their own bodies to own their own futures. So I'll, I'll continue working. Excellent. Heather. Um, I was thinking about this quite a bit, you know, the, the theme of the conference, how you use your power, and I think, um, maybe unsurprisingly, I still use my power in subversive, sometimes controversial ways. In my work now, I uh, run a sex worker advocacy program, and I get to spend amazing time with diverse, incredible, resilient sex workers every day, and so bringing the idea that sex workers need to be part of our feminist movement, um, bringing the idea that uh, you know we're on indigenous land and we have to reconcile with these beautiful spaces that are also taking away resources from the people whose land we're on. And I've also been thinking a lot about what we can do to make sure that the people who built these buildings, the people whose land we're on, the people who are serving us food and water and who are making sure that we have resources to be in beautiful air conditioned spaces for an amazing conference are not forgotten, that we are fighting for them too, the people who are serving us at this conference, not attending it. So I think in those ways, those are the conversations I'm trying to have with other attendees to remind us all where we are. Wonderful. Mm. Wima. Well, um, I'm so far using my power in the right direction, I would say, uh, trying to connect with, with people, trying to, to learn. Um, because the, I know there is a lot of things that I still don't know, a lot of work that's being done that I don't know about. Um, I would also try to bring visibility to the table. And I do consider myself privileged in the way that I'm here, but a lot of people do not even know about these kind of opportunities. They have no information, they have no access to information. So I'll try to, to focus on that more. Yeah. Ladies, you're all doing incredible work, a really admirable effort. Thank you very much for sharing with us the stories. Uh, Wima uh, from the uh, African Queer, Queer Youth, Youth Initi Initiative, <laughs> uh, Heather, uh, feminist and educator, and uh, Carla Aguiri from Planned Parenthood Global. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.